Do you want them off? Mine's off. Okay, I'd like to return to the public works section, session of the Rockville Center School uh, Board of Education. May I please have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll turn it right over to Mr. Gavin for his superintendent's report. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a busy opening to school. I just wanted to let everyone know that tonight we will have two presentations. One will be on our ELA curriculum review process, and the other will be on our security procedures process. And I want to caution the public that there are certain steps that we take when we do security uh, public pre uh, presentations on security. We do not go into all details about all the different precautions that we take. That's done on purpose. Uh, certain things need to be kept secret. And with the advice of police, we have definitely gone through all of our security procedures and we're not going to be highlighting anything like that this evening. So I did want to say that. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that our Hewitt and Wilson playgrounds are in. Uh, we have like one little tiny thing that has to happen at Wilson that I think we can get that done in the next couple of days that we're talking about. But they're in, they should have an opening. They just need the glue to dry um, for, the, for the, the carpeting, the padding. So we should have the opening for the Wilson Playground on Wednesday when we get back. So that's very good news. Um, I will ask Mr. Bartels to talk a little bit about the RFP process that we've gone through with the architects. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so to look for uh, new architects, we put out an RFP. Um, we had back six responses, so we're in the process of vetting those right now. Uh, we'll be inviting uh, probably three of the vendors back to have discussions with them um, and, uh, and then have a proposal for the board as far as recommendation to either continue with our existing um, architect or to move to a different one. Thank you. I know we were also in the process of trying to get all the cameras installed on the bus arms. Where are we with that? Uh, all of the cameras uh, on our regular school buses from Guardian, well, it's all of our main contract uh, carrier are all installed. Um, we verified that with the bus company and with uh, the stop arm company. Uh, we are in the process of setting up a time for them to be installed on our mini buses uh, within the district. Uh, but all of our major bus routes have them on installed already. Thank you, Mr. Bartels. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about um, how many wonderful in-person events we were able to have at the start of this year. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending our senior night in college fair um, the other night at the high school, which our guidance counselors did a wonderful job laying out the whole application process. I understand that you know, having a senior myself, several of the members in the audience were a little bit nervous about how their children were going to be able to manage this. I can assure you, they will. Um, and we also had a wonderful uh, amount of, uh, I think we had like 70-something colleges that were available to, to meet with and talk about different options with, with our students. So that was great. Uh, we had um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Murphy, Dr. Walsh, Dr. Moriarty, Ms. McGinn and I met with Sharon uh, Shepard from MLK Center. Uh, yesterday, that was a wonderful meeting where we could talk about um, collaborating and extending our partnership um, to work and benefit the students of ours that attend that center. So that was a really productive partnership, and we are going to meet regularly. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, Friday Night Lights versus Garden City last Friday was a wonderful atmosphere. We had about 3,500 uh, people here on campus uh, between the Garden City football game and the volleyball game that was a packed house inside the gymnasium. That was great. Everyone, I think really everyone was so happy to be there. It was a packed house. Uh, we got up. We did. We were up and we were winning. Um, and we won't talk about the outcome, but uh, needless to say, we're going to get them again in the playoffs, no doubt. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that we had our, we have a number of top 100 athletes already that have been named that we're very excited about. We would like to bring them to the board at some point um, that are in there, either their top 100 for their sport or the top 25, depends on what the sport is. We have 10 students right now, and we still have a number of um, sports that haven't announced. So we're very excited about that. Um, I will also be attending the October SEP meeting. Uh, I was really excited to go to back to school at both Watson and Riverside last night. We had a wonderful time there. Ms. Hackett joined us over at um, Mr. Murphy over at Riverside, which was a packed house as well. Mm -hmm. 
uh, for their PTA meeting. A week ago, um, because we scheduled all the PTA meetings at the same time, it was a little bit tough, um, but we got to three of them last week. I got to Wilson, Hewitt, and Covert all last week, and in October, we will be attending the, um, the uh, high school and middle school PTAs as well. Um, so that was a, a really good intro to everything. Um, I, as part of the TOK Chronicles, I've already been to TOK twice, uh, which I will tell you, I'm blown away each and every time. Um, Several of the students now are starting to recognize me, and they're like, oh, you're the guy that comes at the TOK. I'm like, I'm the superintendent. Yeah, I'd like to learn what's going on. But um, really, they're, trying, they're, they're definitely in that class pressing students' ability, how, how they think about what they know. And we had a great conversation. I think our teachers are doing a wonderful job. And I'm going to continue to go. So I'm not stopping after two chronicles. We're going to keep chronicling the TOK. Um, I also co-taught a Shell Silverstein lesson over at Watson with fifth grade with Miss Rice, and that was a lot of fun. Um, our students really blew me away with their insight into the poems, which were not easy poems, a lot of imagery, um, but they were able to kind of bring it through and walk through an analysis, and I was really impressed. Um, and I'd like to thank Mrs. Rice for inviting me in. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, there is, we've had some discussion about restarting an alumni association. So one of the things we'd like to be able to do is you know, kick out an email to the community and also put it on uh, 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 the RVC Moms and uh, Facebook groups that are related, related to the community so that we can start to have a robust, you know, Southside High School Alumni Association. And the reason is twofold. One, it's always good to keep alumni up to date about what's going on. But the second reason is if we ever wanted to do a career fair, we have alumni that have been successful in a wide range of careers that I'm sure would be happy to come back and share their experiences with our students so that our students get a better sense of what possibilities you know, are out there. So look for that um, over the holiday break. So my, that email will probably be coming out either Monday or Tuesday. Um, and we will also be having a QR code attached to it. So we will be doing something with that at homecoming as well. Um, we also... Uh, I met with student government twice in the last week, our student government representatives, to talk about a homecoming baby clothing drive for Love Nana. So Love Nana is an organization that's an offshoot of um, the Backyard Players. Uh, she collects baby clothes. Um, Nana's great. Nana's about yay big, and she had me at hello. I don't know what else to say. Um, but she collects baby clothes uh, for needy mothers and packages them up. And when they package them up, we, we, they have adults with disabilities that work and package them up as a partnership with Backyard Players. Several community members are a part, a part of that as well. And the student government was so impressed, they already came. I said, you guys, you figure out how you wanna, how do you wanna publicize this? What are the things you wanna do? They're doing a public service announcement through the TV uh, station. They're doing that, I think, tomorrow. If they didn't do it today, they're doing it tomorrow. And there'll be flyers and so a social media campaign to go along with that. There'll be bins at every building which is great, and then we'll continue to, to collect those things. So if you have baby clothes up in your attic, I'm not talking when they're five or six, but mostly up until you know 24 months. That's usually the, the donation size, particularly if you have baby shoes. Baby shoes and baby socks, those are things that are very hard. People don't often donate them, so if you have baby shoes and baby socks, that would be great. I will be asking my wife to go up into the attic with the 47 bins of baby clothes that we have <laughs> to go through and see where we can come with that. I also wanted to uh, wish um, everyone a happy new year coming up with the uh, Jewish high holidays. Happy new year and best wishes for an easy fast because we will not see you before Yom Kippur. Madam President, that is my report. Thank you. You've been busy, Mr. Gavin. Thank you. I'm excited for the children at Wilson and Hewitt to see their new playgrounds. I'm, I'm glad that's come to completion almost, just about. Any questions from the board on the superintendent's report? OK, kick it back to you, Mr. Gavin. Great. Well, as I alluded to before, we have two uh, presentations for you for this evening. You know, as part of our, our mission and, uh, excuse me, our board goals, one of our goals was to establish a five-year a five year curriculum review cycle. And we have Dr. Moriarty and Dr. Hood who are going to lead us through the first part of that, which is establishing the process, right? So not only do you want to give, come back and give recommendations for what we should be doing, but we also want to establish the process and be informed and have the board's guidance about the process we think we're going to do, and they take some guidance from that as well. And then after that, we will have our security procedures updates with Mr. Bartels and Mr. Murphy. So without any further ado, the dynamic duo that you see before you, we have Dr. Moriarty and Dr. Hood. Uh, please feel free to lead us through your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Gavin. 
Good evening. Uh, we would like to thank the Board of Education and Mr. Gavin for inviting us in here tonight to talk to you about our ELA curriculum review. So as Mr. Gavin just stated, for the 2022-2023 school year, the Board of Education has set five priority goals. One of the priority goals is to establish a five-year curriculum review cycle for all district curriculum areas. This year, we are highlighting English language arts. We purposely are highlighting English language arts because it is the foundation for everything else that we do in school. Reading, writing, listening, speaking. What's important to know is that these board goals really reflect a value of continuous improvement. And it's healthy for an organization to step back and look inside and see what we're doing and how we can do better and where we can do better. Okay, so on the next slide here, we, at, we are asked with knowing our why. Why engage in a curriculum review process? Well, we know that it is a best practice. It supports excellence in learning. And it's, it provides a comprehensive review of what we do particularly well and where there is room or opportunities for growth. We know that according to the World Economic Forum that 65% of the students that are currently in the school system or are entering in the school system, we're preparing for jobs that do not even exist. We wanna be ahead of that curve and we wanna make sure that our curriculum supports that change. We also want to have a continuous cycle of improvement as uh, Dr. Moriarty mentioned, but we also know that we are all teachers of reading of literacy, irrespective of whatever discipline. If you're making a claim, if you're coming up with a hypothesis in science, if you're solving a mathematical uh, word problem. So we wanna make sure that every learner has the best opportunity to reach their full uh, potential. We also want to be able to have our curriculum represent what is best practices in evidence-based research. We want to be aligned with the empirical research. So why engage in a curriculum review process? Because our students should be afforded a world-class education. And we want to be innovative. And we want to have it engaging. And we want to make sure that our students are connecting to that learning in various ways. We want to make sure, sorry, we want to also make sure that we are not only giving them the conceptual understanding and the academic competencies that they need, but we want to make sure that the executive functioning skills, that that is embedded into the curriculum as well. Making sound decisions, being able to articulate, being able to make a presentation like Dr. Mari and I are tonight. We want to make sure that they have those skills that will support them in the classroom and outside of the classroom, whether they go to uh, higher education afterwards, workforce, career, we wanna make sure that they are well prepared. So we owe that to um, our students. We wanna build autonomous learners. So those are our whys. The curriculum review framework, as with every inquiry cycle, we start with the probing design question, and ours is as follows. How might we center the learner's identity for all students, for all students, and ensure we are providing a rigorous and supportive and equitable learning experience? So it begins with vision. It begins with the vision that we have for our learners. And that vision then helps facilitate the creation of the categories that we want to analyze and evaluate through our curriculum. Through that analysis, we'll question, we'll find our strengths, we'll find our areas that need improvement, and we'll develop an action plan that will help us move forward as a district collectively. We will then be able to articulate that plan to all of our stakeholders, and most importantly, to our parents and to our staff members and to our students. 
So when we're looking at curriculum review, we really are looking at a multifaceted approach. It's not a one and done. It, it's, a, it's a very rigorous cycle. Um, and it began for us in July with the board retreat when the Board of Education and Mr. Gavin worked together to figure out what was that vision that we had for the future of our learners. They established the five priority goals, this being one of them, and that really established our North Star for the entire district. And it really was a focus on how are we gonna enhance our learners' experience total in, in its totality. This was followed by our administrative retreat in August, where the administrators, as an entire administrative team, sat down and took that vision for the future and started to probe even deeper and think about the skills, the dispositions, the mindsets, the knowledge, and the understanding that we want all of our RVC graduates to graduate with. That was quickly followed by Superintendent's Conference Day, where we started to work with our teams of teachers, and they worked all day on this looking at our current reality, asking questions and analyzing where are we currently right now? Where is there opportunity for us to grow as a district? And turn our questions and our concerns into design questions that start with how might we? We took these how might we questions and through the month of September, Sonia and I worked with our teacher expertise groups where we refined our research even further. We started to really define those categories that we were really interested in looking at because those categories are what's important to us as a district. It's our values. So we, we really wanna look at those, those categories and we wanna begin crafting questions for analysis. In October, we're gonna start our parent and student groups we're gonna, where we're gonna dive very deeply into the learner experience. What are the learners seeing? What are they experiencing? What are the parents seeing? What are they experiencing? And with all of this information, we're going to continue throughout the school year. Um, so as Dr. Moriarty mentioned, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. As Dr. Moriarty mentioned, um, during the initial phases of data collection, when we worked with our collaborative teams, we came up with those design questions and utilized an asset-based approach. Some of the concerns and ideas that came, we changed those statements into questions, how might we? So some of the questions, how might we incorporate brain research? What does the neuroscience of reading tell us about best practices? How can we immerse that into this curriculum review process? How might we incorporate advanced literacies and embed the five pillars of literacy? which are inclusive of phonics, fluency, vocabulary development, phonemic awareness, and comprehension. We also wanted to make sure that the learning, when I think of true authentic learning, it's more than just having the knowledge presented. True learning can, be, can catapult a new idea, new understanding. So you get the learning, you internalize it, and then, once it's conceptualized, it should spark and ignite a new idea, a new understanding that makes sense to you, that's meaningful to you. So in light of that, we wanna have real world experiences where students make authentic connections to the learning. Students should see themselves in the curriculum and they make connections and then it'll be more meaningful, more purposeful and more intrinsic learning where they can make those deeper connections have those critical thinking skills, have the ability to have the conceptual understanding so that learning isn't siloed, but that it's transferred from discipline to discipline. As another part of our evaluative process, we want to work with all of our collaborative teams and stakeholders. And as you can see here, we have designated times to work with our ELA committee throughout the course of the year from October to April our teacher expertise groups from our grade level teams, our reading teachers, our ESL teachers, and our stellar teachers, which will be ongoing. And also through the PTA curriculum committee, we will be meeting monthly throughout the year. Okay, so when all of these groups start to work together, we really need to remember and recognize that when we think about curriculum, we need to recognize how complex curriculum is. 
And when I, I really struggled for a, we really struggled for a, a visual here to represent curriculum. And it just really brings me back to chemistry class. And I, wa I want you to envision chemistry class and uh, in high school. And, and remember when we talked about atoms and molecules and, and you know they're bouncing around and they form molecules and they form bigger structures and then they bounce around. And that's what goes on with curriculum. We have these different categories that leads us to a layered analysis. Um, and, it, and it's very complex. So when we look at it, we're, we're going to be looking at standards. Yes. Yes, of course. You know, are we hitting all of our standards? Are we hitting them well? Um, are students learning the skills that they need in order to be able to excel at these standards? This includes reading, writing, speaking, listening, content even. Are our assessments aligned to those standards? Are the assessments authentic? Are they ongoing? Do they provide learners with the opportunity to receive feedback in a timely fashion, so, and, and teachers in a timely fashion, so that we can make corrective measures immediately, not waiting to the end of a unit, almost like an autopsy, as opposed to going to a doctor? Is our instruction aligned with best practices, research-based practices? that provide learners the opportunity to engage with one another, to talk, to have discourse, uh, to write, uh, to, to be engaged, build things. Literacy, is it authentic? Are there tech sets? Are students diving into both fiction and nonfiction? Are we challenging, challenging our learners through literacy? Are they writing for multiple purposes? Are we giving enough weight to phonemic awareness and phonics and equal weight to comprehension? All of this is very important for our learners to grow and develop into the, the most academic and, and well-versed communicators that they possibly can be. Are our materials aligned to all of this and all of our goals? Is there opportunity for teachers to have implementation and, and have practice around that? Is there a gradual release of responsibility? Uh, is there professional development around this implementation? Then we really want to look at, is it relevant? Can students make connections to what they're learning? Do they see themselves in it, like Dr. Hood said? Do they, is there a sense of belonging? Do we foster that for our learners? Is there authenticity so that learners have meaning and purpose and that they see that what they're learning is meaningful and purposeful and gives them more curiosity? and leads, it, leads them down more of an inquiry model? Is it constructivist, where they're really literally building things out of nothing and creating something out of nothing? Is there opportunity for transfer, like Dr. Hood um, just explained as well? And do we go beyond just a conceptual understanding to igniting fires and bringing about new ideas? And this is what we want to look at when we're looking at our curriculum. It's so much deeper than just saying we're doing a curriculum review. And we thank you so much for this opportunity because it is really giving us as a district an entire project to work toward together. And when you have projects to work toward together, people come together. Okay, so how might we cultivate a culture of sustained learning? As uh, Dr. Mori already mentioned, we don't want it to be a one and done. We want to cultivate learning and build that uh, competency right here internally. And when we discuss building a community of learners, a school community of learners, it does not only represent the students. We're speaking about our teaching staff, our teachers, our uh, teaching assistants. We want them to be able to have professional uh, learning communities where they can engage in those conversations. They can dive, take a deeper dive into data and have rich, robust data conversations where they are discussing best practices. What strategies that are working for you in the classroom? It's a safe space where we can share those strategies and know that we are providing the very best for our students, tried and true strategies that work. And this slide reminds me a lot, too, of, of a classroom. You know, so when, when we're thinking about a classroom and we're giving feedback to our learners, right, we want to give feedback immediately and timely, like was mentioned before. So as we're going through a review and we see things um, that are apparently clear that we can address now, that we can kind of coalesce around, well, 
let's offer professional development that's continuous for our PM hours for our teachers. Uh, let's focus our grade level teams on that professional develop, development during the day, before school, after school. Let's partner with our universities and uh, institutions of higher education who they can come in and they can give us uh, uh, PD around that collectively. So just like a student in, in our classroom, we don't want to wait until the end of the unit. So we don't want to wait to the end of the year to start taking action on certain items, right? So anything that has to do with tier one core instruction, we want to address now. And we want to continue that cycle of improvement right now, this moment in time. Something new for this year that's going to help facilitate that in a, in a more rapid pace than maybe typically seen in, in most school districts is the beginning of our new educator workshop, which is going to start in October. And our new educators are going to have, the, like, there's 30 of them, <laughs> our new educators are going to join together as a cohort and go through um, a series of workshops with our administrators. And we thank Dr. Walsh and we thank Ms. Green very much for, for doing this and Mr. Weisberg from the middle school. And they're gonna work together as a cohort to work through their own inquiry cycle. So they're gonna learn some stuff, they're gonna take their feedback from their own um, uh, observations, and then they're going to engage in their own little research project. So right away, through this audit that we're doing, this review, we're already seeing opportunities for us to grow immediately and not wait until the following school year. So at the end of the school year, when we're finally done with all of this, we're gonna have results. Right? We're going to have findings, and it's going to be great. Um, and what that's going to do for us is that it's going to allow us to develop an action plan. And that action plan is going to have clear steps for us to take. It's going to set a path forward for us uh, that we can work as a K-12 ELA curriculum team and, and staff members. And it will give us our path forward. And it's going to be wonderful and fantastic, and we really can't wait. I don't want to rush the school year, but it's going to be wonderful to be able to come back and present to you our findings. But most importantly, we just want to leave you with the idea that this process is about honest conversations and having those honest conversations. And our teachers have been amazing. Our administrators have been amazing. We really have had the opportunity to have multiple honest conversations already. Everybody is extremely excited to engage in this endeavor. Um, we're learning so much about each other. We're learning so much about what we already do and what we do really well. We have a lot of strengths. We have a lot of systems. And we're, we're utilizing those systems to help us with this review process. Um, and so the, what we're adding to this is really a system of continuous improvement because of the board goal and a continuous sense of learning for all of us, students, teachers, administrators, and we're engaging continuous feedback. And that's exactly what we want as a academic community is this continuous cycle of improvement. Um, and of course, our learners are at the center and what we want for all of our RVC children. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board? Yeah, thank you. I thought that was really helpful to have the visuals of how this process is um, coming to a reality from, from the idea that we all talked about to the actual um, activities that will take place. And I, I appreciate your attention to the idea of building communities among teachers and learners and the new educator workshop that is not a one and done, but a continuous group that has each other for support and brainstorming and, and ideas. And it seems to me that once this process is in place for ELA, which is obviously the first group, the first discipline that you're studying, we can sort of swap in other subjects, right? So we won't necessarily have the same research questions depending on the, on the academic subject, but a lot of the other slides that you showed us will, will apply. Would you, would you say that's? Absolutely. It's just now a matter of using the same, the, the existing structures that we already have, the structures that we're now building around those existing structures, and just now moving it now into a different subject area. Right, so different questions for Or math. different projects. It could, it could even be a project. Like when, when you hear us talk about our multi-tiered system of support in two weeks, it's, it's going to be a little bit similar, a little bit different. We need to not 
have the same thing, right? A little bit different, but you'll see it. And then at the core of everything is the data. So you, you're correct that it will look different based upon what the data reveals to us. That's what's going to drive us forward. That's what's going to drive our work. So uh, irrespective of whatever discipline, the data will show us what, where we need to focus our energy and target whatever strategies. Um, but that will, it may look very different. It may look similar, but the data will always guide us. The question's kind of in that vein, two-part question. Um, we start with the LA because it's the foundation of education. How do we, you, decide what comes next? Because we're going to be cycling through the process. So will we gain that insight this year through some vehicle that says we really need to be looking at math or science or something that's going to drive the order in which we kind of, what we do next? Oh, I'm of two minds, yes, and I'm of two minds. What I am, my hypothesis with this is that as we're doing the ELA curriculum, we're going to find multiple opportunities for us to integrate science and social studies into this. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's going to be a next logical step. Mm -hmm. But that might not need a gigantic review in, in this way. So we might have a smaller review and then look at math or okay. something like that you know so ela is a great place to start because it is the foundation right. for everything and it's so easy to build tech sets and once we start building tech sets then we start thinking about themes and then we start thinking about essential questions and then we say oh wait i'm curious about this can i integrate social studies and science in this in a very meaningful way mm -hmm. and then our core one instruction is really bolstered with this deep understanding of content areas embedded in this Right. And the kind of the second part of my question would be, once ELA, the data is presented and we kind of are wrapping up that review, what happens to ELA in the next four years? I think the community should understand that it doesn't mean we, we drop it. Oh, yeah. Yes, it obviously is going to what you're saying about science and social studies and math problems. So it's at the foundation. But we don't want to make it appear that this curriculum review is subject specific to, the, to a fault and that we are ignoring the other things that are happening in the subject. So I just am curious as to how ELA phases out of being the focal point but still continues as part of the, a constant review cycle. Well, I think that ELA, that like you said, we don't just forget about ELA because this whole curriculum review process is fluid. It's fluid. So where we see opportunities, even though we may be moving on to math, we are still revisiting. We're just taking a deeper dive because it's the spotlight year. But as we meet ongoing with our professional learning communities, as we are reviewing data from NWA, 3 to 8, K to 12, we will continue to embed and make tweaks and modify as we go along. And um, I think that's all a part of 21st century learning mm -hmm. that, you know, we don't just keep it and say this is one and done, but we're going to continue to revisit it. Even though we may have another subject area as a spotlight, we still will review and modify as necessary. But whatever the spotlight year, we just take a deeper dive into that particular content area. I think you remember the slide where they talked about how many different meetings they're having. Mm -hmm. So instead of using your expertise groups might fall off that year, but you're still meeting with the ELA curriculum. So in terms of like the structures, you still might meet two or three times. Usually after, I would imagine, like Dr. Hood said, you'd usually meet after, you know, get some uh, data dump. So maybe like after the, the fall NWEA you might meet, or you might meet after the January NWEA just to kind of do a check. You have data to base it on, but then you're also asking like, we did some changes on the curriculum, how are they going so far? Right. So you're kind of doing that continuous check-in. Right. Yeah. To, Go ahead. Yeah. Just to do that check-in. And then yeah. like uh, uh, Mr. Gavin mentioned, after the NWEA administration, or the three to eight, or K to 12, the assessments, the state assessments, if we see some patterns and trends, mm -hmm. we're gonna say, you know, let's revisit this right now, and in our next meeting, then we have to incorporate some strategies and make some adjustments and modifications based on the data. Because if we really truly are using data to inform our, our instruction, then we have to use data to inform our instruction. Thank you, it was great. Um, I guess my biggest question would be similar to what you just said. So if we are looking at ELA and we're taking a deeper dive at ELA, but we're using data to inform our instruction, we're still looking at all of the other subjects, mm -hmm. just not as deeply as this. So the parent climate 
uh, climate survey, I don't know what mm -hmm. we're calling that, yep. when that comes out and all of that feedback comes back to you, would that inform what we use as our next spotlight, yes. maybe, if there's an issue that's glaring there? Absolutely. Okay. And, and part of our professional learning, too, is that we want to get to the place where this is ongoing in our grade level teams. And we're continually, so once we train and we train very well around ELA, now this becomes a natural cycle that happens every month or the beginning of every unit. So the beginning and end of every unit, we're now looking at what we're doing, how did the kids respond, what were, what were our assessments like, et cetera, et cetera, and then we, we can start making adjustments. You wanna think of it like a constitution curriculum. It's a living document that you can, there's certain things that we're gonna definitely always say, we're not gonna touch, but all standards are gonna be covered, right? But how we do it might look a little different from year to year based on what our data is and based on that cycle of mini cycle review that goes on in the, what typically are called professional learning communities, grade level meetings. And that's gonna be very important, and that's key. I mean, we have expert facilitators from the outside and experts in the field, but we have a strong base internally. And we can build those competencies right here and have teachers turnkey information once they're trained. And you know, sometimes doing things new for the first time, you really have to build a certain level of comfort and competence. And we have that. And through those professional learning communities, we will be discussing the data. We will be looking deeply at the curriculum and teachers will become experts. And they'll be able to then turnkey that and share that and then facilitate uh, professional learning. It won't only be uh, Dr. Moriarty and myself and our teacher leaders, but we'll build leadership and empower teachers um, from within. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, and I particularly am pleased to see that there is a strong focus on relevant, responsive, and sustaining education built into this review process and questioning how we move through. Um, we do have a diverse pool of learners, so I think it's really important that that stays as a, as a focal point to what we're doing. Um, one of the questions I had in this slide, it talked a little bit about this idea of vision. So where are we, where and how do we grow that vision? Is that a conversation that we're, we're pulling from somewhere that exists, or is this like the vision going to be crafted at the onset of the review cycle? Like, where are we going? What are we looking for? So, yes and yes. We've already established part of the vision when you guys, when the Board of Education sat and said, you know, we need to make sure that we have a very uh, rigorous yet supportive educational experience that all students are seen in, in the work that we're doing, right? And these are gonna be our five goals. Then as we work with our teachers, our, we ask the teachers, we ask the administrators, well, what is your vision for an RVC graduate? What is important, we went to the mission. What does the mission say is important for us? We did go and, and look at the work that we're doing at the high school with the TOK and uh, the work around the IB learner profile and uh, cultivating creative thinkers and risk takers and you know people who value multiple perspectives so we looked at all of those things and then we asked our teachers too what is important we're coming to a collective consensus and and we're all very similar around what we want so right now we're in the process of creating a vision of literacy for the district because that goes hand in hand with curriculum so what is our vision for literacy? What are our belief statements around that? Then what is our vision for the, the curricular experience? What experience do we want learners to have when they're with us for their entire day, basically, right? And then for their entire journey. And it will come out and, and we will keep massaging it and massaging it until it is exactly what we all feel comfortable with. I think to piggyback on what Dr. Moriarty and Dr. Hood just said, um, the added benefit is that we are creating community around the vision, right? So, you know, as our teachers are starting to go through and talk about what are the things they do and what do they believe that they do well, we're also com coming to understand that we have a wide variety of experts already here, already doing a lot of different things. 
But one of the things that you've, uh, they've also found out is they may be doing it slightly differently. They may have a common vision, but they're getting there slightly differently. So they're talking about that. And what are the differences? What do they actually mean? Should we change those differences? Should we keep them? Are they okay? So I think that was a big piece in, towards, in terms of trying to create community around a question. Um, the other point that I would like to make is that when we talk about you know, the review process, for all of our different subjects, because theoretically, simultaneously, we could be reviewing seven subjects at the same time, right? And you'd have to be able to keep all of those tracks in your mind as you're going through seven different layers all the way through. But that has to become part of muscle memory and what we do, right? So our teachers should be thinking about how did that unit go? Um, how did our students do within that unit? So how did I teach it? How did they learn it? How did they give it back to us? And then are there things that we want to tweak and we should do that collaboratively? So if it didn't go particularly well at Riverside for one reason in fifth grade, they need to have a conversation with everyone in fifth grade. Is this me? Is this everyone? Is it the unit? How do we make those decisions? And I think that's an important part of getting, getting a system together. And I think that's what the goal has helped us coalesce around. So I appreciate the board's leadership uh, in terms of trying to create those goals together and develop systems that we can build towards. Yeah, um, I just had a couple yeah. of other, mm -hmm. other Sorry. comments. Sorry. No, no worries. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Because I do think it's important, obviously, that you, you have your goal. We know where we want to go so that as we design, we're very, very structured in doing that. Um, I think the one, one question or more comment is over the past few years, we have had a lot of um, parents in the community who have raised question about how we teach reading, um, our reading program as part of the literacy program, as part of um, you know English and ELA. So that is one area that I think does need an extra special look. Um, based on my understanding from conversations last year, we don't use a single program. We use a variety of programs, which is problematic to the extent that we're not using a program systematically the way that it was designed to be used. Um, I understand we use a little bit of Teachers College, we use a little bit of Fontes and Pinnell, we use a little bit of Foundations, more, more of our phonics, but it was referred to as like TC Lite, which is not a reading program. So I think just moving forward and looking at reading, I would love, just personally, and I think a lot of members of the community feel the same way, that we really do a deep dive into the science of teaching reading, mm -hmm. specifically K through two. Um, maybe investigating some structured literacy programs. I know Limbrook has just started a whole new program um, mm -hmm. with structured literacy, sequential learning. I'd love to know a little bit more about what they're doing, what they're seeing, because it really seems to be much more rooted in, again, like that science of reading. Right, so something that we're already doing. So our, our reading teachers are part of those expert groups. Mm -hmm. We're gonna meet with them five to six times over the course of the year, and we have already had them in, in this room, actually. And we've also met with our K-1, and we're meeting with our second grade teachers this coming week. Uh, we are in the, in the process of reading a book right now uh, called Shifting the Balance. So it's a little shifts that we can, can do from a, uh, balanced literacy approach to a more structured literacy approach. When we think about literacy, we want to think about the five pillars. And, and we read the research around that. That was something that we did for Superintendent's Conference Day. All K-4 teachers, we read the uh, national report. And, and with that, we teased out those five pillars and, and what we do, what we might not do and need to do, and that is what we are working on right now with that. We also are bringing somebody in to talk to us about uh, the neuroscience and what happens in the brain when you do read and what we need to do in order to be able to facilitate that. Uh, just We just also want to ensure that we have a robust curriculum that allows us to um, really engage students in comprehension and also building vocabulary and background knowledge. So we don't want to lose that either. So it, it, it's a tightrope, and, and we're going we're gonna to research, and it's going to inform what we do with the ELA curriculum as well. Yeah, that That's would what be I was going to mention to you that, just like Mr. Gavin mentioned and what uh, Dr. Moriarty just mentioned, we are looking at evidence-based research to make sure that the five pillars of literacy are represented. And whatever we decide from that based on the data, we are going to look at a program so that it is systematically throughout uh, K-5, through particularly on the elementary level, like you mentioned, K-2, to because that is the foundation 
of learning. And if, if, if we don't get it right there, then we're gonna have trouble, um, you know, continuously on the way up, continually through, uh, through uh, from K to two, from three to 12. So we are working hard to make sure that there is no room for error and that we get that right. And like I mentioned before, it may sound redundant, but the data will guide us. So we're looking at those evidence-based, evidence research-based evidence research uh, programs that we know to be good and true. We're, we are having an expert come in to really inform us more on the neuroscience of reading. And then we're engaging in reading um, on a professional level and building professional communities so that uh, we are better informed and that we know uh, what, what are some of the best programs out there and what the science says. Great, thank you. I, I really do look forward to hearing about what you know what we learn and getting you know, our elementary students, specifically those primary students, into a really solid program for reading. Thank you. So thank you very much and you'll continue to keep us updated as you fine tune everything and as you go through the process in the community as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Great job guys. Thank you. And now our next dynamic duo, <laughs> I'd like to introduce Mr. Bartels and Mr. Murphy to talk a little bit about our safety and security procedures that we have implemented here in Rockville Center. Thank you, Mr. Gavin. Uh, I think I'm going to start out and go through the first couple of slides and then turn it over to John. Uh, we do take security very seriously in Rockville Center. We have implemented many measures within the school district to keep students, staff, and visitors safe. Uh, we're going to start this update tonight with security cameras. So we have close to 500 cameras district-wide. 200 of them, about 40%, are external cameras. The rest are all inside the buildings. These cameras are monitored throughout the day by security staff, uh, administration, and central office. Um, they, uh, they have approximately 30 days of history. So as we go through, uh, if, if, if we need to go back and, and look at uh, what happened in a certain location, we can do that. Um, and the police also have access to the cameras. So um, in an emergency, if they need to access them, they do have that capability. Uh, we do monitor that activity, so if the police do um, log into the system, we would we are able to track that, so we know exactly when they're when they're in. They're not doing it when at at any time. They're just doing it for emergencies. Um, for visitors to buildings, uh, we have a visitor management system in each building. Uh, really, it's a single designated entry spot in all of our buildings for visitors. So once school starts in the morning, after all students are in, we only have one point of entry for all of our visitors. Uh, they're required to buzz in to all of our buildings. Um, and then we have an audio intercom at the elementary schools and the middle school as well. Uh, there is a sign-in process uh, at all of the buildings, uh, and everybody has issued identification tags uh, for all visitors. Uh, at the high school, we have uh, a number of staff outside uh, as well as inside, and we have upgraded our security booths. Uh, they're not in place yet, but they are on site. Um, they'll be replacing the two we have at the entrance and the exit to campus, as well as we'll have one near Fireman's Field uh, for the security guard that's out there. Uh, they will have electric, so they will have heat and air conditioning. Uh, as well as um, other interior space for counter space and for any other information or, or data that they may need. Some of the security measures that we have during the day, um, all of our classrooms have phones that can be used to call 911 directly. Uh, all of our schools, uh, except Covert, will reach the Rockville Center Police. Coverts will reach Nassau County Police, but we do work uh, very closely with Rockville Center Police and Nassau County Police. Uh, they work hand in hand. So um, many times, uh, if there uh, if there is an issue at Covert, Rockville Center Police may be the first ones uh, on site. Uh, when somebody dials 911 within the school district, we have something called an E911 system, uh, which provides an alert. 
So it will provide alert to the building principal and it provides it to central administration. Uh, that comes in the form of a telephone call and an email. Uh, so um, the administrator can hear uh, real time what the 911 call is. Uh, so that's a very important part of our, our communications. Uh, we also get uh, Nassau County Police Department alerts. So if there's something going on in a neighboring district, um, some sort of activity um, that the police are involved in, we will get alerted, uh, again, through a uh, phone call and email to certain administrators in the district. Uh, and then we have the ability to make that determination if we need to go into a lockdown or a lockout condition uh, in any of our buildings based on the proximity of whatever is happening in Nassau County. Uh, we also have the ability to make announcements building-wide from any phone. So if there is an emergency, um, we do have that capability. Uh, we also use walkie-talkies uh, around the district, uh, again, to assist in communications. All of our buildings uh, go through emergency management um, trainings uh, and drills, and John will talk a little bit more about that, but they all have an off-campus evacuation site. So each building has a separate uh, place that they would go to in the event of an emergency and they would need to evacuate the building. Uh, we have parent notification through robocalls, Rockville Center app, social media applications, and email. So we try to keep uh, the community and the uh, parents involved whenever a uh, situation occurs uh, just to provide that um, piece of information and communication to them. As far as emergency drills, we had something called Project SAVE implemented by New York State a number of years ago. Um, that requirement uh, had all school districts develop a district-wide safety committee as well as individual building level committees. Uh, so we have a district-wide safety plan uh, which we go through, we update each year. Um, which is more generic uh, and that's uh, available. Building level response teams, uh, our responses uh, are done by the buildings. They are not available to the public uh, because they contain specific information that we really can't and shouldn't be talking about uh, in public, such as what the evacuation site would be. So I'm going to kind of turn it over to John, kind of pick up right in the middle here with the emergent procedures for staff and students. Thanks, Robert. So, so the the three different response teams here are the interplay between the technological benefits that we have, and we have a wealth of resources technologically in terms of physical plant, and the marriage of that with our human resources. The cameras, the guards, the houses are only as good as the people who are using them. So this is a snapshot and to a thin but deep slice of pie that we're about to do, knowing that we're not going to cover every single incident, every single drill every single opportunity, and I'll close with those things that we will not have the time to cover but are equally important when we talk about emergency. So there's an interplay of different teams. It's not a team that are keeping our kids safe, it's teams, multiple. And if we've learned anything in the last recent years, we don't have to worry about level of awareness. We no longer have to sell staff and students the importance of these drills, unfortunately. What we do have to do is implement them with fidelity and that's what we're learning. The drill itself is important. What happens before and after it, we're learning is even more important. So the three different committees here are not the only committees. There's the district-wide committee, which consists of the people in this room, as well as law enforcement and the town village. We, we met over the summer. Our most recent meeting was September 8th. This is the inner team. The reason that they're, they're dealt with first on this is that they are going to go to any major event irrespective of the building or location. So this is the, the hub. Um, they would also form the communications group with the community, with the media, with law enforcement, with the other agencies, given the, the parameters of any given instance. So there's an, a district emergency plan that consists of us. We communicated with Commissioner Vafides, Sergeant Pellegrino, uh, uh, school Officer Ballas, sorry, just changed the last name, Kathy <laughs> Baxley, Dr. Walsh, and myself, to discuss the parameters and the scope and sequence of what we're going on this year. We've done this before. 
the issue when we come together is here is our building plans, here's our scope and sequence, here's what the law says, now what are we going to do with it? The students and the staff that are with us in 2022 are very different than they were in 2018. So the drills, while looking similar, have to take on a new life and a new, and a new approach. At the same time, there are building level teams. These are the teams at the local level. Each individual one is creating their own emergency management team that operates separately. That would usually be the principal, emergency staff, and people who are willing to say, in the time of a severe emergency, I go, I'll go forward. Um, they are the inner circle that starts to create their crisis management team. They're intimate with the building. They know the protocols. They know the safety drills. They know all the staff's names. And they're updating their plan. That plan will be updated, revised, submitted to Mr. Gavin, and then submitted to the state. That plan, in turn, is given to the police department so that they have a compendium of resources, not just our si single emergency plan, which is kept in confidence for the reasons that Mr. Bartels stated forward. From there, thou those plans are then implemented building-wide so that every staff, every student is familiar and comfortable, as comfortable as can be, with the plan, keeping in mind that in today's day and age, the drills can become more traumatizing than the event itself if you're not careful. So there's a very basic, we've done fire drills since the dawn of time. We've done these drills, but what happens before and after to introduce so that we're preparing kids and not making them further or more anxious is the art and the science that we're now embroiled in, where we bring in uh, experts. So that most, uh, that meeting in September 8th, and I'm not, we can go on all day, and Mr. Gavin told me I'm not allowed to, so it, it is a sliver of a pie, and, and it's a plan moving forward. We've all done the drills. I've worked with Commissioner Pellegrino multiple times. Um, but it's how are we going to do this now? And a lot of the literature is suggesting that the after drill is as important as the drill itself. They're for instance, they're suggesting calm down moments when the kids come back so that they have time to decompress what we just saw. It's almost like taking a test and not getting the result. Okay, we had the drill, how do we do? What was the response time? What could we have done better? I can't hear you talking in the, in the halls next time. Um, so that, that information is taught as a learning opportunity, just as we would anything else of educational value in the building. The police are becoming more and more familiar with the campuses. Now, we've been doing this uh, goodwill tour um, throughout the district that we've been to a lot of events, and they're a lot of fun, and their familiarity, and they're to put names to faces, but they also serve another purpose. As a result of doing that, we're more intimately available with every building. Um, I've been to Watson a bunch of times, not like I have this year, um, where we're walking around so that when that, God forbid, a crisis does occur, the only people in the building are not the only ones who are familiar with the building. They may not be the first response to emergency responders. So it's familiarity and, and, and informational um, is, is that next that next level that we're exploring that we've always done in the past, but we're becoming more cohesive about it. The procedures that are being shared are not just within a silo, so I'm meeting with the principals next week to talk about something else, but also sharing their findings when, they, when we did a, a scope and sequence of their building. From car keys, do you have keys to who's your emergency responder? Do you have a safe room? What's your, what's your export? If there's an emergency drill, who knows the evacuation site? Um, there's a series of things. Um, at the same time, the police are informing us and we are informing them. So it's a duality when we have these, these meetings. They're informing us of the best and most current research in terms of how to conduct these. We're telling them who we are. Meaning, if you come to Southside, this is the room where our students with the most severe disabilities will be. This is the room where students who can't make it down the stairs are going to be. It's a safe room. Here are our medical supplies. In the event the principal is not available, this is who you go to. This is what we have in our go bag. So we go in through a series of things. By the time they have arrived, half of the job has already been done. I will say, just as my personal aside, um, during these walkthroughs that we're about to schedule throughout the buildings, uh, 
I'm working with Sergeant Pellegrino, who's been amazing, that there will be an individual walkthrough with uh, administration, the building administration, and the police officers. One, to become familiar with the floor plan, very simple. But also to have a, a, a representative from the um, Department of Homeland Security to familiarize the staff with the RAVE app. The RAVE app is also called the panic button. It's an app on the phone. Um, it circumvents 911 and everything else. It's given to a few key members. And in the event of a real emergency, I mean a real emergency, you press that and the world comes. I mean everyone. So this is the ultimate. It, it skips the queue with 911. It goes right to the foreground. Um, that's my watch. Siri. Oh my. See, she was excited. Um, so, so I that we weren't allowing that, public comments. That, the, the reason Homeland Security needs to be there for that is because the app is the only federally recognized one, and they need to make sure that everyone knows what's going to happen. I know, too detailed. I'm getting it, Mr. Gavin. I'm going forward. So, the, we're my, good, we're good. If, if I was the principal of the high school, my goal, I have 90 seconds because my job is gonna change at the 120th second. I am now no longer in charge. My goal is to create the circumstances where I can hand off the building to emergency personnel and give them everything they do and get out of the way. Now I'm an information officer. So that's what we're practicing in the drill and to understand your role. Now you get out of the way. So this is very specific, very concrete. And the drills, when we do them and how we do them, are as important as what's being learned. So, yeah, there's, there's the law that states that we have to do a certain number of drills. And it's important that we know that there are swipes, uh, side swipes, and that the police have not only keys, but their own car keys in the event they want to get into the building, which they do become familiar with, by the way, off hours as well. And that in the event of a dire emergency, they have access to our cameras so that they can navigate the building under a severe crisis. And we do do drills, but the police department is, is informing us, and this, is, this makes sense, that you don't start the year with a lockdown drill. The, the students and the staff need to be gradually blended into confidence, because that's what the, the drill is supposed to do. It's supposed to instill and breed confidence and get you more comfortable so that muscle memory kicks in. They do suggest gradual graded complexity so that you move toward unscheduled, unprompted, so that when the kids know that it's happening, that there's the less risk of trauma and more risk of learning. So when I say that there'll be a planned active shooter drill in all buildings, I don't mean during lunchtime in the middle of the day. There's a difference between a lockdown drill and an active shooter drill. Sure, a lockdown will occur in the event that does occur. An active shooter drill is a whole other level. And that one we do with adults in the building. The last time we did that, it was in cooperation with Northwell Health that was coupled with Stop the Bleed training. Um, talk more about that throughout the year, but the police are gonna cooperate and in all probability, students will not be in the building and that will be conducted with adults, with um, social workers to be uh, met with afterwards because it's pretty intense. Um, so this is the law of, of the minimum numbers, but again, it, there are minimum requirements. It, there's, and there are any number of different drills. Sure, there's lockouts and lockdowns. There's uh, stay in place orders, and that could be as innocently as enough as we have, to, we have to close the hallways off because we have to escort somebody who needs medical treatment, or somebody's in the hallway who's seriously hurt, having a seizure, and we don't want to disrupt them. So that's just stay in place. Um, there are a number of different degrees, and all of these are situational, meaning the drill is one thing, but we're having a fire drill. If there's a fire on the east end of the building, we're running west. So a lot of it is, is learning how to plan and monitor and adjust based on the situation. The drill is to breed familiarity and comfort. So there's a lot of different layers here, and that doesn't even cover half of what we do. In other words, this didn't cover DASA. This didn't cover uh, social media alerts. This didn't cover um, self-harm, mental health. All of those are equally important to security, but they are worthy of, in and of itself, a separate conversation. This is 
the emergency drill sliver, just so that you know we're, we're not forgetting things. Sources of strength is as important to security as is a shutdown drill. Done now. All set? Mm -hmm. Again, this will be coming in future. It's not, un it's not as unimportant. It's equally important, which is why it deserves a whole separate conversation. And before we get into uh, the board's questions, I want to just reiterate that the Nassau, Nassau County trains Rockville Center. So Nassau County and Rockville Center police departments have a very in-depth and common training thread about how to handle different responses. Um, I went to the county meeting with Nassau County Police Department. Um, that was amazing when they told, showed you the range of different options and how they work with the local police departments as well to make sure that we have that interagency cooperation. I think that's really important because we have schools in multiple jurisdictions. Um, and so we have definitely harped on that with our, the Rockville Center Police Commissioner and with Nassau County Police Commissioner that we want to make sure that that relationship stays solid and that we're constantly communicating with both police departments. That was the first thing. The second thing that Mr. Murphy brought up that I think is really important is that idea of muscle memory. So unfortunately, we keep having to learn and adapt from tragedy. So um, New York, Nassau County has really given uh, Rockville Center Police Department the latest and best tips of all the things that we've learned with the unfortunate tragedies that we've had to face in a multiple of states over the last few years. So I think it's really important that you know, those tactics change from time to time. So that's why we have to do the drills all the time. Um, you can't you can't just you know just keep doing the same procedure over and over again. So you have to make sure that you've had that constant layer of communication between interagencies. You also have to make sure that um, all of our systems are functioning. The Rave app, um, as we talked about, and Mr. Murphy said, that skips 911. That goes that goes straight out of the queue and it goes out. And when he says people are coming, that's every agency is coming. Nassau, it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of, of town or if it's at Covert, which is under Nassau County's jurisdiction. Everyone is coming and everyone will be there. We've been assured by uh, Commissioner Vafidis, less than 90 seconds they will have police on site. So as Mr. Murphy said, it's really incumbent upon our building administrators and teachers to work to really optimize that first 90 seconds. What we do there saves lives. That's why we talk about muscle memory. That's why we practice. That's why we rehearse. I'm sure now we'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Any questions? I just had a comment. Sure. Um, I attended that Stop the Bleed Northwell Health thing many years ago, and one of the best things I, I learned from it was how well equipped our RVC, PD are, and the equipment that they have in their car so they can immediately get in if they need to within the 90 seconds. So there isn't that wait time that there has been in other tragedies where you're waiting for some other agency to come, our police can do it. They, they have the equipment and they have the training to do it. I think, you know, one of the things Commissioner Fidi says is that we're coming. Whether it's one person who's going to be there in a minute and somebody and the rest of us are going to be there in 90 seconds, but we're coming and we're coming in. Nassau County says the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. Um, they will not wait. That has been, unfortunately, what we have learned, and there will be no hesitation on that's what they train for. They train for it all the time, and they are grateful for the opportunity to train with us because it forces them to think about what they do, too. So it's a reciprocal opportunity for us to learn. So I think that's really important to, uh, to, to note there. And I really appreciate both Nassau County, um, the Department of Homeland Security and uh, Commissioner Vafidi's cooperation so that we're all working in concert together to, to really be prepared for what we can. That being said, you know, we want to make sure that we do things that, you know, we're doing our drills that make sense for the age level too. We want to make sure we're age appropriate. You know, as Mr. Murphy talked about, social emotional health is also really important when you're doing these drills that you don't want anyone to panic as a, as a result as well. Robert and I attended the BOCES one as well, and I mm -hmm. loved the fact that he was reiterating to all of the superintendents and uh, board members that they would not hesitate, because I do think that's a concern from parents uh, based off of things that have happened. One other thing from a previous incident um, in another district was that the cameras that were being monitored by police were not live, and ours are. So I think mm -hmm. that's also important, that they're not looking at old footage. Correct. If they're looking and have to pipe into our footage, they are able to see everything in real time. They're not looking at it four minutes behind because those minutes make a difference. So all of those types of things, we have modern technology, we're using it correctly. Um, 
one of the things I think parents get concerned about, but it plays into what you're talking about, is this police presence. If they don't get educated on our buildings, if we are in an emergency, they don't know where things are. So they have to be in our buildings. So you will drive around town and see police cars outside schools, and that's a wonderful thing, but it also scares parents, because then they're left to think, what's happening at blank school today, that there's a police presence? So I think we, as a district, have to find that healthy balance of making parents feel good about the fact that police are in the schools, but if there's a reason the police are in the schools, that parents are notified, if there is a problem, because it's hard to tell the difference, and especially for our little learners who don't have cell phones that they can, they shouldn't be taking them out, but they, you know, <laughs> they do. Fair enough. But we need I, to make sure parents feel good about that. I agree. I would also contend that part of the memory that we're trying to instill, especially with the little ones, is in time of, of, a, of a severe crisis, these are the people that I want you to run right. toward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they are anxious in the presence of a police officer, that's a learnable opportunity. We can control that. Right, and so we have for, to. Right. So, like, for instance, in the high schools, from, from Detective DeLuca uh, to Officer Ballas, there's a, there's a history of them coming in, sometimes plain clothes, sometimes, but for them, to, the kids to see them mm -hmm. under non-emergent situations, which is hugely valuable. So I, I understand the raised yeah. awareness whenever you see a police car, but it is incumbent upon us to familiarize right. the students with the emergency services so that they associate them with safety. I, I, I think oh. it's important. I think we need them in our buildings, and I think the students need to be aware of them as well. My concern is we don't want parents who are outside of that before they're able to speak right. to their student and understand why they were there, they drive past buildings and they see police presence. For me, I know why they're there. We, we know why they're there but we, they're not always there for the same reason. I'm just saying we should be cognizant of how parents feel when they see police presence at schools. It's scary. I, I think it, they should be confident that there's, if there's an issue that they need to be notified, that we will right. notify them. That, right? That's, I think I, that's, that's yeah, what I yeah. want us to pledge. Absolutely. We will let them know. If there's a if there's reason, a reason you know, right. we may not notify them if they're parked outside of the high school right. because they're walking through the high school all day. Right. right. Mm -hmm. It may take all day to go through every single different nook and cranny of the high school. So. They might say, why, why are the police outside all day? Is something going on? It might be a walkthrough. It might be a training. We're going to look to schedule training with them for faculty. But if there's a reason for parents to know, we will let them Thank know. Thank you. They do stop by to say hello. I'm not being facetious. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. And they That's love great. it. Yeah. We want that. We, we mm -hmm. do. We want that. We just don't. We want our parents to also feel yep. confident that yep. we will communicate with them. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Thank you. I, I had a few questions about some of the. the um, the, the lockdown drills in particular. Um, when we have lockdown drills, do the police join us no. for those drills to, to watch, to comment, and then to debrief? They have come in by invitation, um, which they will do, um, but not automatic every single time. I wonder if that might be a valuable tool to have, just an extra set of eyes watching the drill, and then after it, having that time to sit down and say like what went well, what didn't go well, and then being able to immediately articulate that to teachers. Um, just because I feel like the more, the more training that teachers have on it, because in the moment they're the ones that we're trusting most you know, effectively to take care of the students that are with them. And I, I think having the police, someone who is, not that we're not well versed on it, but they're just another set of eyes with another perspective that it might be a valuable tool to learn from, to have them present to, as we conduct planned drills. Actually, more than you know, because during a lockdown drill, administration have very specific roles. We have a place to be. I can't be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So the police are afforded that luxury. You know, who didn't lock the door? Yeah. You know what I mean? Or whose window who, panel who, is open. Right? I went by this hallway, and mm -hmm. I could still see kids through the glass. So I agree. From our perspective, we have done it. In honesty, not during COVID. So yes, yeah. that is something that we could reinstill. And then um, with regards to lockdown as well, I know there's the RAVE app, which is a larger issue. But if there was a need for a lockdown, do teachers have the ability to call a lockdown, like punch something? I, I don't know what the actual thing is. But I'm just thinking our buildings are big. And if you're in a part of the building that's maybe less visible, that has kind of an, a cove, and you see something, you want that building to go into lockdown immediately. Do they have a way to call lockdown in the school? No. 
They have access to 911 from anywhere in the building, but they do not have access to, nine, to lockdown automatically. Which, once they do that, a whole bunch of us get the actual 911 call on our phones. So we can listen and in initiate that within, I wouldn't say within five seconds of them calling it, but pretty close. Yeah, I just wonder if there is a way that teachers, I know there is an app you can put on your phone. I'm not sure if it is the Rave app or something else. I have it on my phone. I don't know what it's called. Like I can call in lockdown from an app on my phone if needed. Again, those seconds, if we're talking about 90 mm -hmm. seconds, 15 seconds matter, 20 seconds sure. matter. So I would love mm -hmm. to see if we can investigate a way to give, to empower teachers to be able to call lockdown if they need to. Um, and then also along with that, with protocol, you know, just looking at the research on active shooters, we know in middle schools and high schools, active shooters tend to be people who are in the building. They don't tend to be people who are coming from the outside. And as such, they would know when the opportune time would be to do whatever they were going to be doing. Do we practice lockdown drills during passing time and during lunchtime? Okay. As I said, yeah. the goal of the police is to have gradual, graded, increasingly complex drills mm -hmm. that will involve things like that during a lunch period, for instance, during passing times. Um, that's something that if you do early, I think could be counterproductive. But I do think it has huge value, right? If yes. it's graded and implemented, scaffolded, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, so, I yep. Agree. So that would be a plan that at some point, mm -hmm. but the students at this point would know if a lockdown went off during passing, do they know what protocol to follow? That's part of the conversation during the first drill. So after you do the first drill, it's usually probably during the middle of a period, shall we say. So everyone's kind of in place. So you do the drill and then you have a conversation afterwards. And then somebody might say, oh, so-and-so was in the bathroom. What do they do if they're in the bathroom? That prompts conversation within the classrooms, and that helps us learn and adapt and be ready for the next time. So, guys, the next time it might be during lunch. It might be during this. What do you think we would do? And you walk through it. It's a learning process for everyone, mm -hmm. including the teachers. Because something, as much as you can practice all of this, there will almost always be an emergency when it, you know, that doesn't happen and conform to the things that you practice to. So it's about making good decisions in time, and that only comes when you practice over and over again. Yeah, I think, it, I mean, if possible, just getting that protocol out to all students as soon as possible, even if it's, you know, picking like a content area like the social studies teachers mm -hmm. having that conversation in a safe space where children have time to ask questions. Because again, in a moment, if you don't know what the protocol is, especially a sixth grader or a seventh grader, that leads to panic. Yep. And then the last question I have, sorry. Um, also, again, looking at research on active shooters, there's never been an instance where an active shooter has breached a locked door. Are our classroom doors locked throughout the day? They weren't during COVID, they should be now. Okay, can we just also ensure that all mm -hmm. teachers understand that classroom doors should be locked at all times during instruction? Great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, moving on to policies. There are a few policies that are in the first section of the board manual that really do not need any revision because they're based on education law or New York State law, um, but they haven't been looked at since 2002. So policy 1110, school district and board of education legal status. Council has recommended no revisions. Are there any comments or questions on 1110? No. Okay. Are we comfortable moving that on to stage two? Yes. Policy 1120, Board of Education Authority. Similarly, this is education law, so there's really no revisions suggested. Are we comfortable moving this on to stage two? Yes. Yes. Policy 1210, Board of Education members, qualifications, also education law, and public officers law. Are we comfortable moving this on to stage two? Yes. Yep. No. Resignation and dismissal. Also, education law and public, public officer's law. Are we comfortable moving this one on to stage two as well? Yes. Yes. Policy 1510, regular board meetings and rules, quorum and parliamentary procedure. Mr. Bernowski, did you want to talk about this one in terms of the notes? You have to give us some direction. <clears throat> the expiration of the executive orders the emergency uh, 
there is no longer needed uh, remote screening uh, without a public uh, in-person meeting as we were in the past. What remains extant is the pre-pandemic teleconferencing procedure for board members. Board members pre-pandemic can attend and participate in a public meeting provided there is notice of their location and the public is permitted to attend either location. So if one of you are on vacation in Miami, the same Miami Hilton, so long as that is published, you go to the lobby, the public is able to be with you, you can participate remotely. So that remains the same. What is new, however, for which we need guidance, because it requires a resolution of this board and a uh, revisionary policy to implement, is that there's now a procedure whereby a trustee could do that remotely, but not permit the public to be with it. So again, to use my hypothetical, if one of you is on vacation in Miami and staying at the uh, Hilton down there, but you have COVID, you could adopt this resolution and adopt the protocol whereby you could still participate, but not have the public attend with you at that hotel. But you have to take certain procedures in order to implement that, and that's why we need a direction. So you have to adopt a policy, a resolution, and in fact, as we call it, hearing before you implement this. So that's really the basic question that we need your direction on as to whether you wish to proceed in that matter. Can I just ask a question about, can you define participation? I, I, something voting. reminds me in the past of... Voting. I'm so, voting. Voting. In other words, you can actually, under the pre-pandemic teleconferencing, you can vote, and under this as well, if you adopt this procedure. Okay. There's a couple nuances, though, that I want to get into it, in that the remote person the pre-pandemic teleconference, where the public is permitted to attend, that counts towards the forum. The new one, however, doesn't count towards right. the forum, so you still have to have three people live in the room. Right. But we, if you give us the direction, if you wish to do this, we'll prepare the resolution and the policy to comply. There's another number of technical requirements as well. There's one further thing. There's this emergency meeting, and this is new as well, whereby if the local body, and we have to put this in the same resolution and policy we to adopt this or implement it, in the event of an emergency, which is defined loosely in the statute, to include sickness, etc. But say you had a massive flood, a power outage, something in the community that you could not readily have an in-person meeting. There are procedures for that as well. There is no real definition right now, it's a fairly recent statute about what constitutes an emergency, but we can certainly prepare this for you. Do you want me to go up there? Yeah, they can't hear you at home. Sorry. Well, and Sorry. We, we have experienced that with Hurricane Sandy, where board members were dispersed, administration was dispersed without electricity and internet access. So I think it's something we need to consider. Is it two separate items? In other words, if we say yes to one and no to the other, or is it both lockstep? Um, it's two separate items. You don't have to agree to both. However, if you wish to implement, we recommend that you do it as one package. If you decide for do both, we would prepare one policy and then one resolution adopting that policy and implementing it. That would cover for COVID and or. Sandy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Max of God. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any opinions either way? It's not just COVID though, right? It would be illness. Yeah. Any, any illness. Kind, it could be anything. Right? Yeah. Monkey pox. It could be a bad flu. It could be right. whatever yes. it is. Yep. But you said okay. you could be on vacation too. Yes. And you yes. could also be, you sick on on vacation. Vacation. <laughs> also be sick on vacation. Also be sick on vacation. No, we yes. don't want to be sick on vacation. <laughs> I think the difference though is if you're on vacation, you can attend in a public place yeah. remotely right. Right. in the lobby. Correct. If you are you're sick, sick right. you right. can't yeah. do that. Yeah. So that is correct. If you're sick, the, the theory procedures. would be you'd be in your room. Correct, right. yeah. but the, I think the procedures are yep. stricter, the notices, mm -hmm. the things we must do in order to have someone be sick and not have the meeting in a remote public place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And extraordinary circumstances for that may include disability, illness, caregiving responsibilities, or any other significant or unexpected factor or event that precludes the member's physical attendance at the meeting. And, and by the way, we did distribute client memos. I don't know if you received this yeah. on, yes. on both of these topics. Mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. 
I'm personally fine with people being able to participate remotely. I think that's part of where we're moving to and how we've been functioning. So I think if we can encourage participation and somebody can't physically be here, I'm all for it. That's my opinion. I don't have a problem with it. I want the resolution with all the things in it. Just spelled yeah. out. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's going to be very difficult to meet all of the requirements that are there for someone to be sick, but if we have to, um, we can. Mm -hmm. If you give us direction, one of the gray areas, one of the questions we haven't answered is you want to have the emergency meetings, you know, and you cannot physically meet. Well, how do you then declare the emergency if you can't meet? But we'll, we'll, we'll address that when we get to it. So should we leave this at stage one then and yeah. get the resolution and, okay. Well, the question is whether you want us to prepare, think, prepare yes. a resolution yes. and yes. policy yes. revision. Yes. 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 We're okay. all in agreement. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Policy 3120, relations with the municipal governments. There were some slight changes made by council. <coughs> Anyone have any questions or comments on 3120? We're okay to move this to stage two? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Policy 2002. Administrative authority during the absence of the superintendent of schools. Again, this was just one that hadn't been looked at since 2002, so I don't think there are any revisions needed. Anybody nice. have any questions? 4230, right? Yeah. 4230, yeah. I just thought that maybe we should note that the superintendent should communicate to the president of the board who the designee will be. And yep. I know that you have been we doing don't. that yep. and we, yep. we've had that done, but I think that that is an important step because the board needs no, the notification of who's mm -hmm. in charge. Yep. So I thought- It's also in my contract. Uh, yeah, well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's important. So we should mm -hmm. add that in here? I, I, that would be my okay. addition. Yep. Yep. I'm fine with that. Yep. Yep. 4260, okay. sorry. You got that, Mrs. Hilberti? Thank you. Evaluation of the superintendent of schools. We discussed this at the last meeting. Um, we changed some language to reflect the instrument that we will be using or a broader instrument than what was written. Anybody have any questions or comments on the evaluation of the superintendent of schools policy? Can we move that to stage two? Yes. Sorry, Mrs. Barry, going back to 4230. Yeah. Are we going to move that forward with a revision or are we keeping it? I think it at so. Stage I'm okay. comfortable with that. Is okay. everyone okay with that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 4260, evaluation of the, oh, no, that's that. 1335, duties of the extra classroom activities funds. This had no revisions at the last meetings, so can we move it? Stage three? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Agenda format, policy 1511. We had asked that it was reflective of the agenda format that we've been using, not the one that was in the original policy that hadn't been looked at. Any board members have any comments about 1511? Makes sense, thank you for, yeah, thank you for the clarifying change. that. Everyone good with that? Mm -hmm. Move that to stage mm -hmm. three or stage two? Yeah, stage, yeah. yeah. So okay. we go to stage three. 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 Perfect. Yeah. And policy 7350, we had asked council to look at this again and council came back to us with advice. I'm gonna ask Ms. Love to give us some feedback on this one. So this change is due to, um, in this past August, Governor Hochul signed into law an amendment to the education law uh, regarding special education students. The update to the policy is reflective of this amendment, which focuses on procedures for notifying parents of special education students when certain behavior supports are utilized. Thank you. Is everybody okay with moving this as written? Any questions? Yes. I, I just I, I think it just needs to be clarified that the word disability is back in there because yes. of what we discussed. Yes. Just yes. so everyone yes. who watched at the it last, last time meeting there was discussion about yes, yes, broadening it, but we're leaving it as it was written originally for that reason, Ms. Love. The Thank you. For the law. Yep. Right. right. Yep. For legislative intent. Thank you. Policy 5320, expenditures of school district funds. Can we move this to approval for the next meeting? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. So we won't make changes to the finance committee's um, level until this goes Correct. through for approval. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the minutes as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I have a motion to approve the financial reports as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Can I have a motion to approve the receipts of financial reports as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Can I have a motion to approve board actions A through H as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you on October 6th for our next regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you.